Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church Friday Night Live message. And this week's topic, are animals capable of giving and receiving love? So what does the Bible say about this topic? That's what we're going to be discussing. So let's give people a few minutes to show up. And while we're waiting, we can go over a few announcements. The first is that uh, the live talk is going to have the same uh, format as before, where we're going to have a 30-minute talk and then 30 minutes of Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments throughout the talk, be sure to ask it in the comments below. And then whenever we get to that point, we will go over those. And also, if you have any prayer requests, be sure to reach out to us. There's a section on our website, creationcarechurch.org, where you can fill out uh, prayer requests and message us. Or you can message our Facebook page or email info at creationcarechurch.org, and we can connect with you that way. And also, if you're not sure maybe who Jesus is uh, or what your uh, status is about your salvation, um, how do you become saved, uh, how do you know if you're saved, things like that, uh, we will be happy to talk with you about that one-on-one, -on -one, set up a uh, a time to talk, whether it's through messenger or video call, whatever you prefer. And also, uh, like I said, our website is creationcarechurch.org. If you haven't checked it out, uh, be sure to check it out. We update it about three times, four times a week. And so there's all kinds of showcased content with uh, articles from people who are talking about uh, God's love for animals or various issues related to um, animals in scripture and creation care. And then we also have uh, the live talks are posted there. So if you miss them, you can be sure to watch it that way. And we have all kinds of other things there as well. So just look around and um, we have videos, we have articles, we have uh, lots of things. So be sure to check out creationcarechurch.org. All right, so for the talk today, it's are animals capable of giving and receiving love? So can they give love? Can they receive love? What does the Bible say about this? So before we get started, let's say a short prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time where we can come together and look into what your word says on this important topic and give us insight and discernment of why exactly you created animals and why did you create them the way you did and what does it have to say about you as our creator and about animals that you created them in this way regarding love? So just give us discernment, give us open minds, and give us a heart that's ready to be transformed and uh, minds that are ready, ready to grow closer to you and deepen our understanding of you. So we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start off with a scripture verse. 1 John 4, 8. If you have a Bible, be sure to get it out because we're going to be going over a bunch of scripture verses because, again, it's not important what we think. It's important what the Bible says. So let's look at what the Bible says. 1 John 4, 8. And I'll be reading primarily from the New King James tonight. First John four eight. It's a little one toward the end. All right, first John four eight says He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So this is referring to God's essential attribute is love. So Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. So if you have that, that love of God abiding in you, then you will express that love toward those around you. Okay. So if you're not doing that, then that's evidence that God is not in you. So there's some change that needs to be made if that's happening. So love is described as God's highest or most holy attribute, his essential character. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of scripture verses that have to do with animals giving and receiving love. And so if animals were created by God with this capacity to give and receive love, 
then this means they were created with the capacity to embody God's most holy attribute. So if, let's say, this uh, evidence that we're presenting tonight, um, you see that it's true, then what bearing should this information have on your life? That's kind of the question to keep in mind throughout tonight's talk. So let's look at another scripture verse. So Matthew 23, 37. That's the Gospel of Matthew 23, 37. So Matthew 23, 37 says, and this is Jesus speaking, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So here Jesus is describing his own love for his people, for Jerusalem, and he's comparing it to the love that a mother ha hen has for her baby chicks. So, of course, the, the main point of this is that he, he loves us, he wants to protect us, he wants us under his wings so no harm can come to us. But he specifically uses this illustration to describe his love because we're all aware, especially everyone there in Jerusalem and the surrounding towns, they know how uh, mother hens protect their babies, they protect them under their wings. And uh, that illustration really captures the kind of love he has for us because it's true and obvious to everyone around him that mother hens love their baby chicks and they love them, they protect them, they watch over them, they take care of them. So the illustration only works because it's true that animals can show love for each other, according to this verse. And let's look at another one. Let's look at Psalm 91.4. That's Psalm 91, verse 4. And that says, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Or he's, he's protecting you. And so basically this verse here is essentially the, the same illustration, but here it's the Old Testament. And this is talking about God. He shall cover you with his wing, his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Well, what's that illustration we just described? And this applies to most birds, not just uh, chickens. But uh, under your feathers, under your wings, you take refuge, the protection, the shield. And so uh, there's there again that illustration where God's love for us is like a bird, a mother bird's love for her babies. And so Jesus uses this illustration to, to describe his love for us, and the psalm describes God's love for us in, with that same illustration. So this should give us some indication that uh, not only do animals love each other, but they love each other in such a, such a true and powerful sense that that's the illustration used to describe God's love for us. And it's also um, the kind of love that we should have for each other to embody ourselves, right? So let's look at another verse, John 15, 12. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12. There Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So he's saying, I want you, to, you, my followers, to love each other in the same way, the same kind of love that I have for you. I want you to show it to each other. And so if he says, my love for you is like a mother hen's love for her baby chicks, and I want you to love each other in that same way, then that means we're supposed to love each other the way animals love each other, right? The way a mother uh, protects her babies. Mother, mother hen in this case. So we're supposed to embody that same kind of love that is attributed to animals, the kind of love that they give uh, toward each other. Now, 
Of course, these are, these are illustrations, and the illustrations only work if animals really do love each other in this way. So it is proof in itself that animals do show this kind of love. But there's another very powerful example. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's Numbers 22. And we're going to spend a little bit of time reading through that because it's important to get some of the details. So let's look at Numbers that's uh, in the Old Testament, one of the first few books. Uh, Numbers 22, and we're going to start with verse 22. So this is Balaam's donkey. So Numbers 22, starting ver with verse 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he, Balaam, went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. So basically, God tells Balaam this instruction, and Balaam decides to go kind of uh, against this instruction, and so he's doing something wrong, and so then this angel of the Lord comes to strike Balaam down and kill him. And so Balaam's donkey somehow is able to see the angel, but Balaam doesn't see the angel, okay? So that's what's going on here. And so Balaam's donkey kind of veers off the path to avoid this angel holding a sword ready to kill Balaam. And Balaam doesn't realize what's going on. He doesn't understand why uh, the donkey is doing this. And so he starts beating the donkey saying, why are you being disobedient? You're supposed to be walking this path and you're deviating. So continuing, 24. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. So a wall on both sides. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. So again, the donkey's trying to avoid this angel who's there to kill Balaam with the sword, okay? But the, the donkey sees the angel and is trying to save Balaam by avoiding this angel. But each time the donkey does this, Balaam beats the donkey because he thinks the donkey's just being disobedient and stubborn. So then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. So here, there, there's this narrow passageway that they're going through, and there's no way to veer off path. There's no way to kind of get up close to the wall to avoid the angel. There's no way to avoid the angel. So the donkey's just like, well, I'm just going to plop down and sit because the only way to not go straight into this angel that's going to kill Balaam is I just have to stop walking and sit down. So that's what the donkey does. And he just, uh, Balaam gets so mad that he's like, if I had a sword in my hand right now, I would kill you because you're being disobedient these three times. So now something interesting happens. In verse uh, 28, Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And I think if uh, all the animals in the world right now could collectively open their mouths and speak to humans, they would say, What have we done to you to deserve the way you treat us? So that's one of the things I love about this story, is I feel like the one time the, the, the animal's mouth is opened up, uh, she speaks on behalf of pretty much every animal, every animal being experimented on, being treated in animal agriculture, entertainment, um, clothing industry, everything. So anyway, so the donkey speaks these words, why have you done this? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have uh, abused, because you have mocked me, because you're not doing what you're supposed to do, uh, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So he says, because you have abused me. Well, you're actually the one abusing the donkey. But because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for I would kill you. So he's so mad at this donkey for, for not doing what he wants the donkey to do that he's ready to kill the donkey. 
He's beating her and wants to kill her. So verse 30, so the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, no. So this is also an interesting part of the story is that this donkey, she is reasoning with Balaam being like, look, have I ever done this before? How many times have you ridden me? And have I ever been disobedient like this before? He's like, no. So he's like, well, why are you beating me? Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe I'm not just all of a sudden being disobedient. He's like, good point. I never thought about this. So the donkey is actually smarter than Balaam, I guess, more capable of reason. Anyway, 31, then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. So here, now suddenly Balaam's eyes are opened and he sees this angel with the sword. So now he, the jig's kind of up and he's like, oh, hold on, something else was going on. I thought this was just this disobedient donkey stopping and veering for no reason, but now I get it. Something else is going on here. So 32, and the angel of the Lord said to him, to Balaam, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. So he's telling Balaam, like, I came out here to kill you because you weren't supposed to go on this journey that you're going on. So 33, the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would uh, also have killed you by now and let her live. So now he's saying, look, if your donkey didn't just save your life these three times, even though you're beating her each time she saves your life, I would have killed you by now. And by the way, I would not have killed her. So you can't say that the donkey was trying to save her own life by avoiding the angel because the angel sp specifically says, I would not have killed the donkey. I was just here to kill you. I would have spared her. But she saved your life by avoiding me. And you repaid her for saving your life these three times by beating her three times and threatening to kill her. So how do you think Balaam felt at this point? He's like, whoops, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> but one of the reasons why I think this is a very powerful illustration of the kind of love that animals are capable of is this is very much in line with the kind of extraordinary Christ-like love that we're called to embody. So remember, Jesus says things like, love your enemy as yourself, bless those who curse you, do good to those who spitefully use you and abuse you, just like Balaam was abusing this donkey here, and um, to return evil with good, those kinds of things. And that's the kind of love that we're all instructed to have, and that's exactly the kind of love that Balaam's donkey um, portrays in saving Balaam's life these three times, despite him beating her for it. So let's look at another passage. Let's look at 1 Peter 3.9. So 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. There it says, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So we're supposed to return not evil with evil or insult from insult or any kind of abuse for abuse, but rather repay evil with blessing, return evil with kindness or goodness. Okay. And that's exactly what Balaam's donkey did, right? Is uh, the, she returned these beatings with continuing to save his life. Now, how many people in that situation, if uh, we save someone's life and instead of being like, oh, wow, thank you so much for saving my life, they, they beat us and, you know, and then they put themselves right back in a position where they, their life needs saved, how many people are going to save that person again? Instead of being like, well, all right, I tried to save you before, saved you, and instead of thanking me, you beat me. You know, all right, fend for yourself. 
But no, this donkey was like, I'm still going to save you again. And then he beats her again. And then she's like, I'm going to save you a third time. And if who knows if this had continued to go on, uh, there's no indication that she ever would have stopped. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to kind of really dwell on this, this example because it so powerfully illustrates the kind of love, not just, you know, hey, I love my babies, uh, but rather I'm willing to endure beatings to save someone's life who's beating me. And that's kind of uh, one of the most powerful ways that we can love is one that the exact opposite of love is being returned. All right, so... For the next verse I would like to look at is Psalm 150, verse 6. Psalm 150, verse 6. So this is the very last verse in the very last psalm. It says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, now the question is, since animals can show love for each other, like the mother hen for her child, uh, they can show love for people, like Balaam's donkey did for Balaam, uh, they can also show love to God. So here it says everything with breath, not just people. So animals have this capability of praising God, of loving God. And some might say, well, is that really referring to animals? Well, yes, but let's look at a couple more verses just to confirm this. Isaiah 66, 23. It's Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 23. So Isaiah 66, 23 says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. All flesh. Now, it's interesting, this word, this phrase here is kol basar, all flesh, and it's used several times throughout scripture, and it always refers to all animals and all people. So it's not just people, it would be uh, kol adam would be all people, but kol basar is all people and all animals. So every creature made of flesh will come to worship before God, and this is a prophecy in Isaiah. So is there any other place that speaks of a similar prophecy? Well, in fact, yes. Let's look at Revelation 5.13. So Revelation, last book of the Bible, chapter 5, verse 13. It says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So this here is a prophecy of every animal, and it specifies, again, it's like every creature that flies, every creature that swims, every creature on the land, every creature everywhere. Uh, the ones that live under the ground, on top of the ground, every animal is going to pray, be praising God and singing these praises to the one who sits on the throne, to the Lamb of God, who is Jesus. And so they're all, all the animals are praising God. So if you look at all the evidence, we have animals loving each other. We have the mother hen loving her baby chicks. We have Balaam's donkey. We have animals loving people. And now we have animals loving God. So are they capable of loving? Yes, in every way that humans are. Uh, they can love God. They can love each other. They can love people. So there, there doesn't seem to be any kind of restrictions or shortcomings or any kind of love that's being withheld from animals. They were created with this capacity to love in every way that humans could. So they have the fullness of the capacity to love. So what about the capacity to be loved? So let's look at 2 Samuel 12.3. So 2 Samuel... So this is just before the books of Kings. So 2 Samuel 12, 3. And again, if you, have, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to be asking those in the chat, and we'll get to those in the second part of the talk. So 2 Samuel 12, 3 says, and this is an illustration where Jonathan is 
uh, trying to convey to David that his committing adultery with Bathsheba and then having her husband Uriah killed, uh, that this is a great sin that he committed. Uh, and so he uses this illustration, and the only way the illustration works is because David understands what it means to have this kind of relationship with an animal. So let's hear this relationship with an, with an animal that's being described to David here. He says in the story, but the poor man had nothing. So there's this rich man and the poor man, and basically the poor man really loves this sheep, raised the sheep as a child. And then the rich man who had many sheep decides to kill this one sheep that has a really close relationship with, uh, with this poor man instead of killing one of his many sheep. And this enraged David, being like, how could he do such a thing? Someone taking the one sheep from someone who really loved that sheep like, a, like his own daughter. So this is the description. He says, 2 Samuel 12, 3, But the poor man had nothing <clears throat> except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And he grew up, and uh, she grew up together with him and with his children. She ate of his food and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and she was like a daughter to him. So I don't know how many of you have maybe a companion animal that you live with or an animal that you've grown up uh, knowing and you know the animal by name. Maybe you have a lot of these kinds of uh, interactions with that animal where the animal sleeps in his bosom, uh, drinks from his cup, eats from his hand. It, he raises this, uh, this little ewe lamb as his own daughter. So that's the kind of love that uh, this, this poor man in the story has for his sheep. And so this illustration only works because David understands that animals are capable of receiving that kind of love. You know, and who has like maybe a dog or a cat or, you know, maybe other animals. Maybe you, maybe you adopted a pig or a cow or a turkey or a chicken. You know, anyone who's spent... Um, time with these kinds of animals and treated them with love and care, know that they're fully capable of reciprocating affection and they want to be a pet, they want to be cuddled, they want to be held, they want to be fed, they want to be protected. And so uh, this illustration is an important one in the Bible, even though, again, the purpose of it was to convict David of, of what he had done. Um, it only works because he understands uh, what that feeling is like to have that relationship with an animal. So uh, an animal can definitely receive love in this way, just like uh, a person could re just person receive love because he says he raises this animal like a daughter. So let's look at another one. Uh, what about God? Does God love animals? Are animals capable of receiving God's love? Let's look at Psalm 145.16. So Psalm 145, verse 16. So Psalm 145, 16 says, Speaking of God, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So God has this, this love for his animals that whenever the animals uh, have these needs, they have uh, the desire for food, uh, and he opens his hand and he feeds them. So he shows them love. And uh, I think that this is kind of the easiest one to show. God's love is on all of his creation, as it says in one of the other Psalms, and his compassion rests on every creature. And so uh, God's love is endless. It's boundless. Uh, any, any kind of love that a human can exhibit, God is able to exhibit that love, you know, even more. And so humans being capable of, of loving animals, uh, that in itself should be proof uh, of God's ability to love animals. And if animals can receive our love, they can certainly receive God's love. So let's look at another verse. Let's look at Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2.15. So the question here now is if animals are capable of giving love and receiving love uh, in all the same ways that humans 
are capable of giving and receiving love, then what does that mean about our relationship? What's our relationship to animals supposed to be like? Okay, so let's look at Genesis 2, verse 15. There it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. So that word there that's translated keep is shamar. And shamar means to keep, preserve, protect, watch over, or care for. So that was the instruction that God gave humanity, that it says, uh, I created you in my own image and my own likeness. So if God is love, what does that say about us who are created in God's image and likeness? Well, we were also created in that image and likeness of love. And as such, we were put in charge and instructed to to shamar, to keep, preserve, watch over, protect, care for the entire garden, okay? And that includes the inhabitants of the garden, which means we watch over and protect each other, and we watch over and protect the animals. So we are to be these keepers, these preservers of people and animals. So let's look at another verse. Let's look at Psalm 36, 6. There's so much about God's love in the Psalms. Psalm 36, verse 6, says, speaking of, of God, Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and animals, both people and animals. Uh, that's what the NIV says. Both man and beast here, both people and animals in the NIV. So God preserves both people and animals. And that's exactly the task he gave to humans created in his image and given this dominion, this role of being the stewards and acting God's will on the earth. We are also to be these keepers, these shamar, these preservers of both people and animals. So like, uh, like Cain says after he kills Abel, he's like, what, am I supposed to be my brother's keeper? Yes, that's exactly what he created us to be, was to be each other's keeper and to be the keeper of the animals, to be the preservers, not killing each other, but preserving each other, maintaining each other, showing love for one another. That's exactly why he created people, is to show this kind of love to all of his creation. So it's no small thing that God designed animals with this ability to embody his essential attribute. So let's look at 1 John 4.16. This is the last verse. 1 John 4.16. One of my favorite verses. 1 John 4.16 reads, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So as the NIV says, Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them, because God is love. So if God is love and he creates us in his image of love and he creates animals with the capacity to fully give, be able to give and receive love to the fullness, to love God, to love each other, to love people, to be loved by God, to be loved by people, and to be loved by each other. If animals have the fullness of being able to, to embody uh, giving and receiving this kind of love. And God created us to be the keepers, the preservers, to show this love to them and to each other. Then I think we should, we should really look at animals a little bit differently, to not just think of them as commodities to be exploited or uh, just these beings that we could just withhold love from or, or not even really give love a second thought, but rather... We should definitely treat them as beings who are capable of giving and receiving love and to give them that love. So hopefully you have some questions or some comments. So if you have any, be sure to ask those now because we're about to shift into the second part of the talk.
All right, Angel. Hi, everyone. Hi, Angel. Thanks for moderating tonight. Thanks for joining us. Roz. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, Roz. Uh, can you repeat the verse in Matthew about under the hen's wings and God's love? Sure. So that's Matthew 23, 37. It says, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. So uh, the people here were unwilling to receive God's love. They would stone the prophets, and they ended up killing Jesus and all, most of his disciples as well. So um, people receiving God's love, uh, that's a whole other story. But yeah, that's the verse, and I think that that really beautifully illustrates the kind of love that God has for us. Uh, it's the kind of love that a mother hen has for her baby chicks. So Kathy, thanks for joining us. This is a plethora of proof today on video, YouTube videos, nature programs that show animal love for not only their own, for not only their own, but also across species with each other and for their human caregivers. What do you think it will take for people's eyes to be opened to the capacity for animals to love, especially the eyes of the church? Yeah, good question. So I guess the point being made here by Kathy is if you just look at any kind of video, there's so many videos of animals loving each other, uh, whether it's their own species, their family members, or uh, cross species, you see uh, just, you know, just pick out pretty much any two animals. And there's a video on the internet of those animals, you know, grooming each other, hugging each other, playing with each other. And so uh, it's it's pretty evident now. There's so much evidence, especially in the, the age of internet and YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, just animals certainly have this capacity to love one another. And so the, the question here is, what do you think it would take for people's eyes to be opened, especially those of the church? Well, uh, I think that there's a lot of things we could do. I think just starting the conversation uh, is one of the important ones. And I also think looking at the scripture like we did tonight and just seeing what the Bible says and really, you know, just thinking about it in a new way. Because if you've never heard, you know, this kind of talk before, and every time you go to church, you just hear, you know, talk about God's love for people and how people are supposed to love people. And you don't really hear anything about God's love for animals, people, how people are supposed to love animals, uh, the kind of love that animals have for God. Like those scripture verses that I read, you might not ever hear them uh, taught in, in church and about, you know, the... Balaam's donkey, I think, how can you read that story and not come away from it going, wow, that's some extraordinary love that was shown for Balaam in the face of being beaten every time you show love for him and save his life. That I think just really looking at it and kind of pointing it out, I think that's the, the best way to overcome this blind spot uh, in the church and really to open their eyes is just open their eyes to what the Word of God says, right? And let the Word of God and the Spirit of God speak to them. So that would be what I would say to do, and that's that's the strategy I'm employing. Um, if you have any other suggestions, I'd love to hear them. Uh, I guess one other suggestion that comes to mind is you could invite people from your church to visit a sanctuary. So there's lots of sanctuaries which rescue animals from uh, abused conditions, oftentimes from the animal agriculture industry, so they'll have all kinds of pigs, turkeys, chickens, uh, cows, animals that are traditionally seen as just these food items. And you go to the sanctuary and you see these animals that are being treated with love and how their temperament is so similar to like your dog or uh, other animals that you don't think of as food. And so just seeing these animals in this new way and being like, that could really open your eyes and be like, wow, 
you know, I'd never met a turkey before. And now this first turkey I met is like crawling into my lap, wanting me to cuddle with this turkey. Like, wow, I had no idea this is the creature that I eat every year for this. Anyway, so that would be another example is to like show them uh, animals uh, that are loving and being loved. So let's see, a reply. There's a plethora of proof today on videos that show animal love. Okay, Tim, they will never accept Tim Zona. They will never accept it. They believe the population can't be sufficiently fed without meat and cruel, cheap farming practices. Politicians have stake in these large companies, and they will never allow them to fail, even if they are personally opposed to it. So unfortunately, this is the reality that we live in, is we're uh, living in a world where those who control the world worship money. And Jesus says, you cannot worship both God and money. You will hate the one and love the other. And so these you know, politicians and uh, big business, animal agriculture people uh, are loving money, not God. And so this is the unfortunate reality that we live in. But there is hope because uh, this is all part of Babylon and Babylon is going to come crashing down in a day and all the merchants are going to weep and moan the destruction of Babylon, but those who are following God will rejoice in that day. So it's in Revelation somewhere. Trying to find it without having looked it up first. So I believe it is Revelation 11. Yeah, basically, God destroys those who destroy the earth. Babylon comes crashing down in a day. If anyone else knows where that is, maybe you could look it up for me, and then we can come back to it. But yeah, there's a verse in Revelation about um, the entire world of uh, Babylon and the merchants. Uh, it all crashes down in a day. So the time is coming. Uh, it will not last forever. We have that hope. So let's preach the message of God's saving power and his plan to restore uh, his very good creation. And let's get other people on board. And then when the time is right, this time will come. And the end of all of this misery will take place. Uh, let's see. Flor Delis Cagara Arazo, watching from California. Hi, I'm sorry I probably massacred your name, but uh, thank you for joining us. Good to have you. Tanya, animals give us more love than some humans deserve. Amen. I feel like so many animals are so quick to forgive, and you know, they will see, let's say, a dog who's been in a highly abusive environment, the dog's whole life. And then, you know, every human that comes into contact with this dog hurts the dog. And then the dog gets rescued. And then like a human tries to like stick out their hand to pet the dog. And the dog's like, maybe this will be the first human that shows me love and doesn't beat me. And so it's like, animals can be so forgiving. And show so much love where people hold grudges, will seek revenge, will uh, act from selfish motives. And uh, we see animals just really not doing this in nearly that capacity. But God's love is also undeserved. Like we, we don't deserve God's love, but he gives it to us uh, by, by his good grace. It's an undeserved gift. Uh, but again, like that parable says, where uh, the the man who was who had this huge enormous debt that he could never ever repay, um, his master says, "You know what? Not only am I going to give you more time to repay it, I'm just going to forgive it altogether. You owe me zero. Go your way." Uh, then he goes and when there's another servant who owes him a small amount of money, uh, instead of forgiving that debt, he like grabs him by the neck. He's like, "You must pay me in full now." 
And so then the master finds out and says, you know what, you owe me that huge, enormous debt that you could never possibly repay and puts him in prison. And he says, I showed you mercy and forgave your debt. Why didn't you do likewise to your the one who was in debt to you? And so I think with that um, parable, the purpose of it is to show that we all have an enormous unpayable debt to God, and he's ready to forgive that debt. And all he asks for us in return, obviously, faithfulness to God, uh, that's the greatest commandment, but then also to love our neighbor, extend that same love and that same mercy and that same forgiveness to our neighbor. Second greatest commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So yeah, that's exactly what we're supposed to do is show that love uh, toward others that we received from God without us deserving it. And um, regardless of what we are currently doing, that is within our capacity to change and do that. So pray for ourselves, pray for each other, that we have that transformed heart to show love to all of our neighbors, both human and non-human. So good question, Tanya, or not question, but good comment. Kathy, uh, the story of Balaam's donkey suggests the donkey knew what the angel's intentions were. How do we know the donkey knew the angel was going to kill Balaam and so saved his life three times? So we have to kind of piece together a few things from the context, because obviously if, if every story went into huge details uh, of everything in the Bible, the Bible would be like 100,000 pages long. So we have to kind of piece things together sometimes to get the whole story. And one of the things we can piece together is that when the angel started speaking, the angel kind of revealed some of the story. Uh, where he says, I would have killed you and spared the donkey's life. And how do we know that the donkey knew that information? Well, the donkey was able to see the angel and Balaam wasn't. And so I think we can only assume that the, the donkey also knew uh, that information about the angel's intentions, uh, unlike Balaam. And so if you just use kind of some common sense too, if let's say you're walking down a path uh, and you see someone holding this giant sword, like, you know, like they're poised, ready to, you know, strike and, you know, kill. And it's like, well, how do I know that they're going to kill me if I keep walking toward them when they're posed with this deadly weapon ready to strike? It's like, well, I guess we can't know, but I think just based on uh, what the angel says, revealing the angel's intentions, uh, that makes it clear that that was what was happening. And the fact that uh, Balaam's donkey was responding to those things by saving his life uh, indicates to me that that's exactly what was going on. A uh, good question. See, Angel, what a beautiful picture to envision. Yeah, just, uh, I'm not sure exactly what this is in reference to, but just this idea that uh, animals are able to love each other and love God and love people, and people are praising God, loving God, loving animals, loving each other. Well, this is the way God created the world to be, is to to have this loving paradise where his spirit is just all over and everyone is filled with love and joy and peace and um uh, yeah, like that's the world that God created for people and animals to live in. And we've just destroyed it to such an extent where we made it a marketplace. We made it a place of violence. We made it a place of death and hatred and pain and suffering. And all that's required is for us to turn back to God and stop continuing in this way of the world, to stop living according to these ways that we've been deceived into thinking that we want to desire. Uh, to stop desiring them, stop following those ways, stop being deceived, and turn back to God. And God will restore things at the right time. So Tim, again, uh, I'm referring, I'm sorry, this is Kathy responding to Tim, I think. Uh, I'm referring to the church here, for it is the church's eyes especially that need to be opened. It is the church that must take leadership on these issues. Yeah, I agree, and I think there's a, a live talk that we're, that's in the works about why the church may have these blind spots and why we don't see more 
creation care efforts uh, in, in the more mainstream uh, churches. And I think that one of the reasons is because uh, it's it's not really an easy thing to sell. And I think a lot of churches kind of end up becoming these businesses, um, and it's really hard to, to not fall into that trap. Uh, but then, you know, it's like it's easier to just tell people, well, it's all about just saying this prayer and God loves you, and, like, you don't really have to, to change or do anything um, to to really embody God's love and, you know, do live the way he wants you to live. Uh, but if you start telling someone, hey, like, we have to live this radical countercultural lifestyle, um, like God's calling us to really stand out from the world and not conform and fit into the world. And we need to take a stand against the customs and the traditions that we've grown up in and that those around us are all observing. Like that's asking a lot of somebody, but Jesus says, if you're not willing to forsake all and follow me, you're not worthy of me. And I think that some of these sayings that Jesus says are just kind of glossed over and it's like, well, he didn't really mean that. I think he did. And I think that there needs to be more churches who uh, are really taking that stand and not really thinking, well, our, our biggest donor isn't going to be happy if we say this. You know, or we might lose people, you know, in our church, we're going to lose people who are tithing to us. Um, but those conflict of interests, I think, are, are one of the biggest ones. Um, but I guess the optimistic way of looking at it is that maybe they're just ignorant. Maybe they just haven't read the scripture in this way. Maybe they're just following the way they've been taught. And so there needs to be more people um, who are teaching them what the Bible says and pointing these things out that are overlooked. So that's what Creation Care Church is trying to do, is uh, trying to kind of highlight some of the things that have been glossed over and overlooked in the churches. It's a good question. Now, Tanya, my animal companions are my fur babies. Yep. I think that's true for a lot of people, and I think that's one way to communicate this idea of uh, how God created us and how God created animals and for what purpose. It's because if you have a companion animal where you're just like, oh, I love this animal so much, I love this like my own child, it's my fur baby, then you can understand what it means to love an animal. And so now when it comes to the animals that are on your plate, now how do we get you to show that same kind of love and that same concern that you have for your companion animal, your fur baby, for that animal that's on your plate. And I think that for a lot of people, it's just making that connection. Maybe it's seeing a slaughterhouse video. Maybe it's, you know, seeing a, uh, a cow playing fetch, just like their dog plays fetch. Maybe it's, you know, just w whatever it is that kind of opens their eyes and makes that connection. It's like, wow, I had no idea. And then also seeing just how, how many options there are uh, for eating plant-based food instead of animals. Let's see, and feathered, finned, and scaled babies. Yes, all animals, not just the cute ones. Kelsey, thanks for joining us. Uh, isn't the donkey so reflective of the undying loyalty and love that animals show us today, despite the abuse so many of them suffer at the hands of humans? So profound. Yeah, and like I said, this is, I think if all if animals collectively could speak to humans, uh, what's the one thing they would say when their mouths are opened? It's, what have we done to deserve being treated this way? And that's exactly what Balaam's donkey says when her mouth is opened. And yeah, just that loyalty and undying love, uh, even if we're mistreating them. And I feel like there's so much that we can learn from animals. As the Bible says, I believe it's in Job where it says, listen to the animals and they will teach you. And so I think there's so much that we can learn even just about love from listening to the animals instead of just thinking, ah, oh, you're stupid, you're not worth it, I have dominion over you, let me kill you and eat you because that's what I want to do and that I don't care about you. Instead, let's listen to them, let's watch them, let's, let's uh, understand what it means to have that kind of love and undying devotion and loyalty. All right, Rosalyn, Psalm 104 says that animals are troubled and dismayed when God hides his face, so they obviously feel the love of God. Okay, let's look at that. Psalm 104. Psalm 
Let's see, Psalm 104. There's a lot of verses here, 35 verses. I'm not finding it, but somewhere in there, apparently it says that they are troubled and dismayed. Yeah, and there's several other instances as well of animals showing these kinds of feelings, where, for instance, when Jonah is uh, dealing with Nineveh, and then he says, God's going to destroy this town because of your wickedness, and they all take it upon themselves to repent and humble themselves and fast and dress in sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign of repenting and humbling yourself and um, like crying out to God for forgiveness. And it says that not, not only do all the people in the town of Nineveh do it, but also all the animals uh, fast and uh, repent in this way. And so then at the, I think it's the very last verse in the book of Jonah, where it says, he's tr God's trying to explain to Jonah why this is the best case scenario, is them all repenting. As he says, uh, should I not have pity on Nineveh, this town of, I think it's 120,000 people and also many animals? So should I not have compassion on these people and animals who don't know their left hand from their right? who don't know what they're doing. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's what we want is for the people uh, to repent and return to God. And so the fact that the animals joined in that, I think that's indicative of uh, them being part of all this as well. All right, Tim, again, the church and various governments have worked together since ancient times to set policy and influence uh, these days, the church won't oppose it either because they would lose followers and influence. Yeah, similar to the answer I gave. But again, uh, not all churches are the same. And uh, certainly Creation Care Church doesn't fall into that um, that perspective where we're not putting uh, money above what we're what we consider to be like authentic teaching, which I think there's there's always going to be that conflict of interest. And that's one of the things we've talked at length about internally is that we're uh, not going to do that. We're not going to put those kinds of, of things above speaking the truth. If it means we lose followers, if it means we you know, don't get funding, if it means whatever, then uh, we're just going to speak the truth because that's our, our purpose. Uh, Kelsey, amen. Tim, lots of stickers on that canteen you must get around. <laughs> oh yeah. My, uh, I think most of them are PETA stickers. There's a plant power one as well. Yeah. Not your mom, not your milk. Milk is for baby cows. Think for yourself, go vegan. Yep. Yeah. I do some, uh, animal rights activism and we're often giving out literature and stickers and things like that. So I wanted to decorate my bottle as a conversation starter. All right, Kathy, Tim, I agree. This institution. Yeah. Kelsey, there are a beautiful trio made up of a bear, a lion, and a tiger who are rescued from the entertainment industry, and they all share an unbreakable bond with each other. Yep, definitely animals can uh, can have that kind of relationship with each other. Okay, Fred, I think you're pointing out the scripture verse that I was looking for. It's Revelation 18, or the, the fall of Babylon. Yep. So it says in Revelation 18, 3, the second part of it, uh, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury, so these merchants all become rich, um, including animal agriculture and all those kinds of things. And then verse 11, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Oh no. Merchandise and gold and silk and precious stones and pearls um, and the fruit of your soul longed for has gone from you, 14, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all. 
The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing, and every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Um, thus the violence, the great city Babylon, shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. So this is, uh, yeah, Revelation 18. Thank you for finding that, Fred. Uh, that's the verse I was looking for. That That's our hope, is that one day uh, this all this will come to an end, this commodi uh, commodifying each other, commodifying animals, treating everything as merchandise, as Jesus says, my father's house uh, is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a house of merchandise. That's exactly what we've done to the world, is we've made it a uh, business. It's just everything is for profit. and But that's all going to come crashing down in an hour, according to prophecy. And so in that hour, all the prophets and all the apostles will rejoice because this is the coming of God's kingdom and the destruction of this, this Babylon. So uh, if you have further questions, be sure to continue asking them, and we'll get to those uh, in writing. But for now, I want to close by letting you know of next week's topic. It's, uh, did God kill an animal when clothing Adam and Eve? So the scripture verse is Genesis 3.21, where it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So a lot of people assume that uh, this was after the fall, which, I mean, it was after the fall, but they assume that God killed an animal, skinned the animal, made tunics out of that skin, and put them on Adam and Eve to clothe them. And so people say, well, why are you telling me that I shouldn't kill animals for sport, for pleasure, for entertainment, for taste, whatever? Uh, God kills animals. He was, in fact, the one who killed the first animal. He was the first one to kill an animal when he was clothing Adam and Eve. And so let, we're going to look at that scripture verse, we're going to look at the context of it, and we're going to see if that's really uh, the way we should be reading that verse, and if there's maybe alternative readings, and if, uh, if we can really assume that God killed an animal when clothing Adam and Eve. So be sure to join us next week for that talk. And now uh, let's close in prayer. So if you have any prayer requests, be sure to reach out to us. And if you'd like to uh, learn more about Jesus and what it means to give your life to Jesus and live for God's kingdom, uh, please reach out to us for that. We'll be happy to connect with you and pray with you and um, give you more information about that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and look at your word. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for creating us the way you did in your own image and likeness, in your own character of love. And thank you for creating animals in such a way that they can join us in this wonderful fellowship and have community with us so that uh, they can likewise give and receive your love, give and receive love with each other and with people, and that uh, we can all show this kindness to each other to be keepers of the whole earth and everyone in it, that we could be these preservers, those who care for and protect each other, and that we can extend this, this love and this uh, ability to, to care for each other and preserve each other, share this not just with each other, but also with the animals, and with all of your creation. So Lord, just transform our hearts, transform our, our attitudes, and give us the courage to stand against the culture, against the traditions around us that, that tell us uh, animals are just here for us to abuse and use according to whatever evil desires we might we might choose to use them for. And instead of looking for loopholes in the scriptures to justify treating animals badly and harming them and being violent toward them, instead we look for uh, the reasons to show them mercy and to embody your love and the fruit of your spirit and how we treat your creatures. 
So Lord, just transform us, transform our hearts individually, transform our hearts collectively so we can be more like you. And thank you for, for being here with us and for guiding us and for, for everything that you do for us. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So again, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to having you with us again next week. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.